Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. And as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you are all safe and healthy and well cared for. Indeed. This is an interesting program. It's out of character this week. You know, we've been talking over the past few weeks and again soon with the great Joseph Ellis, uh, a, an ongoing dialogue about the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. You know, some people say that the the great divide is between Jefferson and Hamilton. Not so. Uh, the great divide in American culture is between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Both wanted a republic, but Adams had a somewhat more realistic view of human nature, and so he wanted checks and balances, Mr. Jefferson, checks and balances in a way that Jefferson did not. And so that series of dialogues has been fascinating and Uh, For me, very enriching, I know, for you, too. Yeah, and if I might interject, we do have an upcoming show where Joe Ellis uh, uh, has agreed to spend the hour talking about your new book, sir, which is coming out, I think, June 1st, right? Yeah, so he and I have some um, slight disagreements about the uh, maybe the main thesis of my book, which is that we are no longer a republic, unfortunately, but we still can practice certain small r republican um, styles, um, approaches, habits, and that each individual can become a kind of Jeffersonian and can thus help to reinvigorate the American Republic. Um, I think Joe's view is uh, that horse left the barn a very, very, very long time ago. So that's interesting. You know, but this show um, was about uh, our listeners around the country who have sent in sometimes their voice Uh, thoughts and comments, and in other cases sent an email, and we tried to get as many different perspectives of how people are coping uh, as we possibly could within the course of a single hour. Well, we did pretty well, though. We got through quite a few of them. I read each and every one of these, and I appreciate each and every one of these. There was one that I wanted to get in the show, and I didn't. came from Philip Rosey, He's a follower of the Jefferson Hour, part of the 1776 Club, which is a perfect opportunity for me to say, if you can support the show, we need it and we really appreciate it. It's not like Clay or I take anything out of this show. We do it because we want to and we love to do it. But if you go to jeffersonhour.com, click on Donate, there's a number of different options for you to support the show. And again, we really appreciate it. We also really appreciate hearing from you, and I read each and every letter and and enjoy reading them, and it's great to hear from people how they're coping with the times. But back to Philip Rosie, he's a sailor stationed in Japan. I'll read part of his letter, quote, One or more of the sobering facts of this crisis is that while the majority of the world has the privilege to hunker down and isolate themselves, there are some gears in the world that must simply keep turning for the security of all. And so it is for the American servicemen and women living abroad. My observations, however, as I lead my sailors, are of their stubborn optimism in the face of ever-increasing workloads alongside increasingly uncomfortable security measures. The American sailor tends to cope with discomfort and challenge with a sharp, sarcastic wit that leans on the camaraderie of their fellows. This way of living leads to deep friendships among peers in the service, and the incredible bunch that I work with are no exception. I think Thomas Jefferson would be proud to know that the indomitable spirit of the America he knew in his day is still present in today's America, two centuries later. Thank you so much for writing us, Mr. Rossi, and good health and safety to you and all of yours. Excellent. Well, the more the merrier. You know, we have a a global listenership to a certain degree, and it's always fun to see how Jefferson is playing out in in really completely different regions of the world. And it's so interesting that, you know, again, to not to digress, but the fact of the digital revolution has made this pandemic endurable. People are listening to podcasts. People are talking to each other on Zoom. Conferences are occurring on Zoom and, and Team and, and other uh, platforms. Um, people can FaceTime with their children spread across the planet. You know, the, in in the time of, of the plague in um, Algeria that uh, Camus is writing about, they stopped the mail service and the telephone systems became overwhelmed and collapsed. And so people literally didn't know whether their relatives were still alive. 
Um, they had to wait until the pandemic was over until they could make basic communications again. We are so fortunate that the internet has held so far and that we're able to communicate across distances. The plague can, can infiltrate our houses and crosses state and, and other borders at will, but it can't cross through the internet. Um, there are other types of cyber infections, but, but there's no way that COVID-19 can infiltrate your house by way of your World Wide Web access. And so we have a, <laughs> you can't we have a benefit that podcast, no one else has yeah. ever had. Um, I, you know, I, I'm just trying to get as many of these folks' emails in as I can. So there's another one that you will enjoy from Graham Treadway. Um, he's a teacher, Upper Sandusky, or is it Dusky? Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, he teaches high school humanities classes, and he started a podcast for his students my theme for students has been based loosely on becoming Jefferson's people and the messages you gave us in that wonderful nugget of wisdom. We all have this great opportunity to grow while in the shade here, as I know you and David surely are. That's great. You know, and, and I should say a little bit about that. So um, Repairing Jefferson's America is going to be out soon. And five individuals around the country have paid uh, the very uh, modest cost to, to put it into the hands of every one of their state legislators. And if you're interested in doing that in your state, Ohio or elsewhere, all you need to do is let us know. And for a school, I mean, if, if, if indeed a school is using um, my ideas about how we can become Jeffersonians, we would try to make a very special uh, financial arrangement with that school so that every student could have a copy of this book. It's written in a style that's accessible to high school students. And so it would be great if this book ha had a chance to really um, take root at a time when we're all sheltering and trying to rethink our lives. If you're going to rethink your life, doing so in a Jeffersonian fashion is something that I very highly recommend. So Repairing Jefferson's People will be out shortly. And by the way, so will my comic album. I know you like to scoff at that, but the uh, uh, my, Who, produ my, my producer <laughs> has been working on it. The uh, The cover art is nearly finished. Oh, I, I heard that that's about done. It's very close to being ready to, uh, for distribution. And I, somebody asked me on another program today, did Jefferson have a sense of humor? And I had to say, well, no, not really. Uh, but I do, sort of, uh, depending on who you ask. And so this uh, comedy album um, it, talking out of tights, I think it's called, will be available in the See, next couple of weeks. It's more than a comedy item, album. I mean, it's it's an insight to who you are, and and yes, you do get to show your sense of humor, but it's uh, it's it's much more than a comedy album. Well, I I hope that's not just a way of saying that it's not funny. No, it's an attempt to <laughs> it's an attempt to really talk about the humanities and you know, how how you negotiate a life by way of books. Uh, great literature, philosophy, uh, history. Uh, travel, I got another travel. idea for you if you want it. What is it? It comes from Gary Gilberts. Um, he uh, says some very nice things about the show, which I'm not going to read because I would blush, but we appreciate it very much, Gary. He says, I'm certain that you realize that right now it may be difficult for many to financially support the show, but for those who are in a position that can pay it forward to the benefit of all listeners, such a donation would be gratefully appreciated. And we, we do appreciate that, Gary. And, but then he says, Clay, once America gets over the current crisis, I wonder if you would consider holding a Jefferson boot camp for those of us that are obsessed with the hardcore study of the third president. That's a great so I idea. That's a good idea. That's yeah. a fantastic idea. I've done this, uh, this online course now about pandemics and literature, and I'm starting one on the Enlightenment, six parts, which I'm very excited about. I just got today in the mail um, a new copy of Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now, which is one of the five or six texts that we'll be using along with Harari's Homo Deus and Henry Steele Commager's um, Empire of Reason, etc. And But I think doing a course on uh, Jefferson, I think we would call it Jefferson Boot Camp, and we would uh, either in person or online, but to really dig in and, and spend um, you know five or six sessions just exhaustively exploring the life and achievement of the third president of the United States, that would be very good for me, and I hope it would be useful to some of our uh, supporters around the country. We should go to the show. One last thing I will say is because we have uh, some extra time, I, I know you're um, stuck at your house. Um, our studio is closed. One of the things, and we got called on this recently, an email about it, is that you and I did a series a couple of years ago called Jefferson 101. Right. And 
The plan was always to put that together and put it up for our 1776 club members or whatever. And that is in the works now. It is. Yes. That's good news because I think that's valuable. I would like to um, to get that out along with the comedy album and, and much else and re- repairing Jefferson's America. But I also think a Jefferson boot camp, maybe, a, maybe a one great where idea. We, we, we gather in the desert somewhere um, <laughs> and, and we bake, bake bricks by um, in the morning and then in the afternoon talk ideas. That sounds blended to me. So we'll be considering that. So lots, lots in the works. And we wish everybody um, a time of safety and reflection during this pandemic. Just look at it this way. You're never going to get another chance like this to rethink your life and to dedicate it to the things you think are most valuable and which um, express your value system and your principles. This is the moment in each of our lives to suck it up and decide who we want to be um, for the next 20, 30, 50, or 60 years. Hi, this is Angel Kumasaka from uh, Seattle, Washington. You were asking about how we're doing with the quarantine. I teach fourth grade here in Seattle for the public school. We had hours notice on March 11th that the kids were going home for two weeks and then it quickly changed to six weeks and now it's through the end of the year. It's pretty tricky. Uh, I was stressed out for the first couple of weeks and feeling kind of useless, but now I'm incredibly busy with trying to teach online. I would say the hardest part is the fact that lots of kids don't have technology um, and are trying to join meetings on phones and sometimes not joining our classroom meetings and lessons. Starting last week, some kids started getting those Amazon uh, Chromebooks that were donated uh, that was great. That's really helping. So I just wanted to say I'm doing my best. Uh, the kids are doing their best. Um, it's definitely an interesting, interesting time. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation where we discuss all things Jefferson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and I'm joined by the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Good day to you, my friend. I'm across town here in Bismarck, North Dakota, and I'm happy to report that yesterday I had a load of topsoil dumped on my Jefferson Garden in my backyard. The Jefferson Garden is a, a, a tribute garden to the seeds and the and the style of Thomas Jefferson. Some of the seeds are provided by my friend and your friend, Pat Brodowski, of Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, and it needed a little perking up, and so I had a load of topsoil delivered, and I'm about to uh, go out and spread it out so that I can begin to plant in, in about the third week in May. Gardens and gardeners, it's a it's a whole new uh, level of importance because of what we're going through right now, and, and as you could tell from the clip we began the show with, we're going to hear from listeners this week. You put out a call a, a, a bit ago, Clay, to have listeners report in on what they're doing, what they're reading, uh, what it's like in their part of the world, and Incidentally, I should say, we we have reports this week from all over the country, including some from from Europe. It's it's interesting to follow this process. I think everyone is um, sort of having the same sets of thoughts, uh, our mood swings, and people uh, that there are days in which I wake up and I'm bewildered and I think this can't have happened to the world. And then there are other days when I uh, am filled with gloom about the future and wonder if the pivotal moment of our lifetime will be, uh, say, March 12th, 2020, and whether this will be a blip or whether it will be the, the, the great line of demarcation. I have a very good friend here in North Dakota, David, who's in his 70s, and he had a conversation with his wife. They've had a, a, a tremendously uh, fruitful, satisfying, uh, and, and free life. And the question they asked was, have we seen the best of our time, which is actually a quotation from King Lear, and has the, has the luck run out? Is the world more like this world of uncertainty, economic dislocation, uh, disease, uh, governmental instability, or is the world the one that they have enjoyed since the end of World War II up until um, at least 9-11 and really up until... Uh, the spring of 2020. I think this is a conversation that's going on all over the country 
and all over the world. And I know from uh, in my own perspective, David, that I have been keeping a garden ever since I moved back to North Dakota 15 years ago. And some years that garden flourishes. And in other years, I'm just too busy or too lazy to to uh, really maintain it um, in a, in a uh, in a really well managed way. But this year, it matters more than ever because, first of all, I think it's an important act of uh, optimism to plant these seeds and to nurture them all the way to fruition, and then to harvest and can and and, and freeze and and do all the things that uh, that we can do by way of preservation. But I also think. I know this is going to sound a little bit alarmist, but I'm wondering if this might not be important that we can't guarantee that the world's food supply is going to be as immediately accessible as it has been. You're probably reading about the the packing plants, uh, the slaughterhouses around the country, many of which are uh, having high incidences of, of COVID-19 and probably they need to be shut down, although there have been attempts by the U.S. government to, to pressure them to stay open. But we're receiving warnings almost every day that that even the food supply, which we all have taken for granted for decades, uh, may suffer some disruptions, not unlike the you know the great toilet paper shortage of of the last sixty days. I'm really concerned about all that, and so my garden has taken on a significance that it has never actually had before in my life. It's always been a kind of a, a thing, you know, a kind of a, an avocation, a, a, a piece of harmless pleasure. I don't see it that way now. It comes down to uh, maybe a question of self-reliance, don't you think? Yes. Yeah, I was on a, on a radio program this morning in Chicago, and, and my friend who was asking, you know, how things were different in Jefferson's time, I said, well, here's the big difference. They were mostly self-sufficient farmers. So that if the whole world collapsed, most people in Jefferson's era were able to provide for themselves to a considerable degree. And so if the system collapsed, there would be much less fallout because there was a much wider and deeper rootedness in nature and a greater self-sufficiency. And that actually lasted well into the 20th century during the Great Depression of the middle of the 20th century, which was the greatest previous dislocation in the post-Civil War world, uh, there was still a very large percentage of people who either were farmers or who had relatives, kin, who were farming, and they were able then to um, sustain themselves. Uh, my grandparents always said, we were poor, but at least we always had enough to eat because they were producing their own food. They had steers that they could uh, butcher, and they had chickens, uh, and therefore eggs and and poultry, and my grandmother routinely um, preserved canned 500 quarts a year, even in the last years of her life when uh, hunger was no longer even a remote possibility. So we have distanced ourselves. This is a you know a constant theme, you, as you know, in my talk about Jefferson, that we have so far distanced ourselves from nature and nature's fecundity, and we're so uprooted from the earth that most of the people who are listening to this program right now, including myself, uh, are utterly dependent on a supply system for fuel, for heat, for food, uh, for everything that matters in life, that we can't afford to let it collapse. But it may. It may collapse. And if it happens, we're going to be the most helpless people who ever walked the earth because we got spoiled by the unbelievable supply lines and uh, prosperity of the 20th century. We received an email from Emily Knight, and thank you, Emily, directing our attention to an article from The Atlantic magazine, March 12th this year, written by Megan O'Rourke, titled, The Shift Americans Must Make to Fight the Coronavirus. And it begins, As COVID-19 spreads in the United States, it is becoming clear that America's individualistic framework is deeply unsuited to coping with an infectious pandemic. This requires a radical shift in America's thinking from an individual first to a communitarian ethos, and it is not a shift that is coming easily to most. Americans have allowed ourselves to believe that the self rather than the community must do all the healing. 
Well, we're going to need each other. And one of the things that characterizes rural life, farm life, is, is neighboring. People help each other get in the harvest. Uh, there are quilting festivals, a quilting bee, a crocheting bee, a baking bee, where uh, women usually, and, and church women most often, would gather and, and chat, spend the afternoon uh, working on a quilt or each crocheting something. And, and they would often uh, do these for charity, to give away at the nursing homes or to people who were shut-ins or whatever. So neighborliness and helping out uh, is a standard part, you know, or in, in the ranch world, you know, when it's roundup time or branding time. Generally speaking, the neighbors from 20 or 30 miles away turn up and they help with the branding and the, the home family uh, produces a fabulous um, a meal of brisket and baked beans and and rolls and desserts and jello of every sort and it's a it's a it's a harvest festival or it's a it's a branding festival and this is a central part of rural life rural life couldn't exist without it uh, at least in a non-slave um, plantation sort of world and so this is something that rural America is much better at than urban America on the whole. Many urban people don't know their neighbors. I live in a subdivision in Bismarck, and if you said to me, name the, the five families or the eight families that live closest to you, I could name two, uh, but huh. not the rest. And so this is a, this is a fact of our time, David, and, and we have to face that. On the other hand, so that I do think that, that Emily Knight, who is a good friend of this program, is right. And that we need to be thinking about those things. And it will break down the kind of radical individualism um, it'll have to if we're going to get through the if this gets as severe as, as some people think. But on the other hand, uh, this is a time for you to grow your own food. I've seen your garden. Um, I have friends here who, um, husband, hunter, wife, gardener, and I've asked them, how many days per year can you live off the grid? Can you provide your own food? And for them, it's about 40 and my friend Jim Fugley, your friend too, I've asked him, and he said, well, in a pinch, maybe 60. Now, that's that's not enough, but they are on the road to some kind of either self-sufficiency or the idea of self-sufficiency. And I think everyone's going to need to tighten belts to, you know, I'm cleaning out my larder and eating things that are stuck in the back of my pantry and have been there for months, you know, sometimes for years if they're in cans. We're going to have to uh, not waste. You know, I read recently that one third of all food in the world is wasted. I'm now eating leftovers in a way that I I wouldn't always. Sometimes I I put that leftover in a piece of Tupperware and put it in the refrigerator, and then a week later I realize, oh, I should have eaten that, and, and then I wind up throwing it away. I think this is going to be um, a test. It's we're all going to have to move to a greater self-reliance, and and while we wait for the government checks to come. That's not, in the end, going to be enough. We're going to have to find new ways to live with less and to nurture our daily lives with greater stewardship and husbandry. And, and I know this is a, a time of suffering and, and frustration and, and anxiety. It is for me, believe me. But I think that this could be an important right. period for the American people to rethink a whole series of our habits. We need to take a short break, Clay. When we come back, I'd, I'd like to uh, go back to this article by Megan O'Rourke. Uh, she quotes John Donne, and I want your take on that, sir. Well, of course. John Donne is my poet. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour your weekly conversation about all things Jefferson. I'm your host, David Swenson, conversing with the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. When we took our break, Clay, I made reference to this article that Emily Knight brought to our attention, and it reads, You have probably read or heard the poet John Donne's famous formulation, No Man is an Island, many times. He wrote this line after almost dying from spotted fever in 1623. Dunn was 51 and the dean of St. Paul's Cathedral when he fell gravely ill. Physically, Dunn felt largely alone. Variable and therefore miserable condition of man. This minute I was well and am ill this minute, he wrote. As sickness is the greatest misery, so the greatest misery of sickness is solitude. Well, that's one of my favorite uh, works of John Dunn. So he got gravely ill, nearly died, and, and after he was well, he wrote this journal, this sort of meditative journal, 
following the disease uh, from the moment that he first recognized that he was unwell all the way through to recovery. And he put it, of course, in a deeply Christian uh, framework. Uh, he was the Dean of St. Paul's. He was the greatest Anglican preacher um, in the history of Great Britain. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Dunn's sermons and their relationship to uh, the work of St. Augustine, the great um, fourth century AD theologian. And Dunn was able to meditate on this disease as a metaphor about life, that we are all spiritually diseased uh, and occasionally we are also physically diseased. And, and in this famous um, meditation, he says, no man is an island entire of himself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or thy own were. Every man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. And therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. You know, and that, that's sort of, you know, we're talking about self-reliance, and yet there is an, an, a necessary allegiance to community. Um, it, it's, it's a delicate balance, but that is so well said. The whole thing is worth reading. It's called Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. There are free online versions of it. Uh, it's some of the greatest uh, Renaissance prose uh, created. It, it, it ranks with Raleigh's History of the World or with the prose sections of Shakespeare's plays, or with the authorized version, the King James Version of the Bible. It is a deep, rich, resonant uh, Elizabethan and Jacobean prose. Dunn was one of the great masters of this, and, and he knew how to work a metaphor. And so this sort of uh, casts me forward to a book I'm reading at the moment, uh, Albert Camus' The Plague, which is a classic of pandemic literature published in 1947. Uh, Camus, who was uh, an absurdist, sometimes thought of as an existentialist from Algiers, and he wrote um, this this novel, considered one of the best novels of the 20th century by anybody, about a plague that comes to a town on the North African coast. And, and here's the connection to Dunn, David. Uh, he, he essentially concludes the novel by saying, we all have the plague. Even people who don't have the plague have the plague because we all die. Any one of us could be swept away by midnight. And so when an actual plague comes along, like the COVID-19 plague, it reminds us, it should remind us that we all have the plague. I'm using that in sort of air quotes in a metaphoric sense. And that was Dunn's take too, that each one of us is spiritually sick with spotted fever, even though we may physically be very healthy. And we need to think about our disease and our, our appointment with death. Uh, because we all have it, and it needs to help us to concentrate on the things that matter in life, on love, on friendship, on family, on our relationship with God, uh, our, our relationship with the social compact, with community, our neighbors, and so on, and that these concentrate the mind and make us uh, shed things that are frivolous or distracting or um, impediments to our spiritual or physical health. And so when Dunn says, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, he's talking about the, the mechanism in his time when uh, how people learned that someone had died in, before newspapers and television. When someone died in a, in a parish in London, the church bells at that church would, would, would peal, would, would sound in a certain type of way. And if, if I were in my house and I heard the bells in my church um, ringing, then I would say, oh, someone must have died. I wonder who it was. And I would either go over there myself to find out, and then the the staff of that church would tell me. Or, in this case, in Dunn's metaphor, I would send a servant, a valet, a messenger, and say, go find out who died. And so Dunn says, wait a minute. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. Never send somebody off to find out who it was, because for all practical purposes, it's you. And if it's not you now, it's you later. And so you need to see your own mortality, the fact of human death and mortality in the death of everybody else, and that knits us together as a community because we only share a few things. You know, the cliche is death and taxes, but not everyone pays taxes. But every single person who's ever lived on earth was born and died, um, and there's no escape from that. And these these authors are, are not content to look at plague as simply a, a, a temporary health malady. They look at plague as a, 
reminder of of plague with a in a metaphoric sense. That's um, that's a bit grim. It's grim, of course, but it's also empowering. I mean, I don't know about you, David, but in the last month. And particularly when I realized this wasn't going to be short, this was going to be a long uh, ordeal, a marathon of, 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 of disruption. I've been rethinking everything. I'm looking at my library. My daughter and I, who's here, are having conversations that maybe we wouldn't have had otherwise. I'm thinking about what I want to do with the remainder of my life, however long that is. I assume it'll be 30 years or more. I'm thinking about what I have accomplished and w- whether it matters or not. I'm thinking about who I whom I value, the friends I want to embrace, um, at least metaphorically, and, and people that I don't really care if I ever see again, and how you choose, and 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 you know what is life affirming, and what is life denying, and so on. I th- and I I would dare say that everyone listening is having these thoughts in different ways at different times and different moods. Um, we all are are stepping back because we have been reminded that we're not immortal. Number one, and you know we we fool ourselves from time to time in thinking that we are. And, and number two, we've been reminded that progress is not inevitably forward for more, for better, for finer, for greater mobility, for greater access, for for greater accumulation of the of, of material pleasures. That progress is something we think is linear and forward-looking with a few blips here and there, but that may not necessarily be true. Progress has uh, some great pratfalls. You know, where's the Roman Empire? You know, where are where, where are the pyramids? Who built them, and what happened to them? What happened at Easter Island? You know, if you look at civilization in a from a broad thirty-eight thousand feet perspective, or from the perspective of the moon. You see that most of the civilizations that have ever existed, for one reason or another, have collapsed, and we think well, that could never happen to us. The Roman, no, I mean, where this is different. We have science, we have progress, we have technology, we know things they didn't know. There's stability now, and I think when something like this happens, we all think, "Oh, what if? <laughs> what if something complete? A comet, you know, a meteor." A plague, well, kind, a war that's comes kind of in what we're going through, and trips yeah. us into the ditch. You've you've been having these thoughts, of course. So that's I think what's valuable here. It's look. It sounds a little gloomy. I don't mean to be gloomy at all. I think you your your candle burns more brightly when you realize that you are living your life and seeking your adventures against the framework of mortality. So I'm 65 years old. Let's say I live to be 90. I'm only going to be physically. A spry, let's put it, you know, competent until I'm in my 80s somewhere, if that. So I've got 20 years. So I, what am I going to do with those 20 years? Do I want to be bowling, and do I want to be playing pinball? Uh, do I, you know, do I, do I, do I want to be um, doing video games, uh, or you know, or do I want to climb? Mount Whitney again uh, with Russ Eagle. Do I want to uh, hike across Montana? Do I want to go back to? To Mycenaean Greece and follow the path of, of the Homeric epics. You know what is it that I want? Because this gives me a sense of urgency that I did not feel four months ago, and I'm sure that's true of you and everyone else who's in this conversation. I mean, what what do we still want from life? And we don't know now. I I, I assume we're all going to be alive uh, two years from now, but it's not guaranteed. I want to move on to another letter that I, I really enjoyed. It comes from Stuart Webb. From Kettering. North Hampshire, yeah. And Stuart, um, from me to you, I really enjoyed your email. It was fairly lengthy, and uh, I read every bit of it and enjoyed it very much. He writes that he, he caught up with episode 1382 recently, and he's responding to your request for information on how listeners are coping. He's a registered nurse for people who have a learning disability, working as part of a community team employed by the NHS. That would be the National Health Service of Britain. He writes, how will the NHS cope, especially those on the front line? It will do the best it can, I suspect. He says, I wonder if, as people, we are less self-reliant, perhaps less stoic than we used to be. I see more and more posters advising the public on what symptoms can be dealt with by a chemist. An ambulance drove past me yesterday and on its side was reminding the public that, quote, you wouldn't call the Coast Guard if you fell into a puddle. 
Anyway, it was just a delightful letter, and I hope he's doing well. He talks about Catherine and, and her experiences as well. Well, we so appreciate that. You know, the NHS is a great system. It, it takes a lot of abuse, um, not only in the United States, but even in Great Britain. But it's um, a wonderful institution and absolutely essential. And I think one of the questions that we are going to have to wrestle with in the next couple of years is this. The European model that you see in Denmark and Germany and France and Finland and Scotland and and Britain and Italy and so on. The European model is that the, the state, the society as a whole, has a duty to make sure that nobody slips completely through the cracks, that there is a safety net, that healthcare will be universal. That's that's not even negotiable. You know, the quality of that care is something that's a, an ongoing issue, but that there will be universal, equal access to the healthcare system. That at a moment like this, the government will make sure that everyone has enough money to stay in their apartment, to buy the basic food stuffs, that it, it's, it's going to put a, a safety net under everybody. It won't be living high, but everyone will be protected because the state believes, the, the, those societies in their own social compact believe, that if, that if a, a percentage of the people are suffering grievously and are starving or are desperate, that they're going to become lawless. They're going to take to the streets with guns. They're going to they're going to feed themselves. And people people won't stop feeding themselves. They will find a way. And that it's not only important from a social stability standpoint to make sure that everyone has a sufficiency, uh, especially in a time like this. But it's also morally right that a that a a nation is a generous collection of people, and they understand that people will sometimes uh, trip up either through their own fault or, in this case, through no fault of their own. And so that model, that, that the state has a, an overt moral responsibility to guarantee the basic welfare of its people, is playing out in slightly different ways all over Europe and, to a certain degree, uh, in Asia and elsewhere. Here in the United States, we have a different model. We do have a safety net. Um, of course we do. But it's at a very, very low level, and it doesn't um, include universal access to health care. And so now we have a situation in which the government is writing checks. Some people have received their checks. Others, um, two months in now, still haven't received those checks. And are they one-time um, payments of 1200 or $700, or will they be ongoing? In Europe, David, most of these countries are guaranteeing 80% of the income of each of their residents through the crisis because they know what else are you going to do? You know, people can't coin money and people do not have savings and people don't have farms. And so you've got to make sure people can feed themselves. And, and Europe is doing this and, and, and the American system is herky-jerky and half-hearted and there are people who think it's wrong and there are people who, who blame the poor and, and, and people without access for those very situations and want to moralize widespread human suffering. And so we're going to have to wrestle with this when this is over and decide who we want to be. Do we want to be America where you have to win the lottery or do we want to be a European system where maybe – uh, there are some inequities, but everyone is guaranteed to be able to live in in dignity and decency. And, and you, you talk about you know failure of systems well, and the me the medical systems in, in America being privatized. Uh, there are many rural hospitals that are are going to be forced to shut down of because course. they they don't have the economic resources to stay open which kind of is an argument for that that universal health that we hear talked about so much. I'll, I'll close out Stuart's letter with something. He says, uh, what will be required of us to rebuild our economies? What will it cost and how will this be met? I don't consider the UK to have fully recovered from the 2008 financial crisis. Um, I won't pretend to understand the economic and political implications of facing a similar sized crisis so soon again, but it worries my stomach, an organ whose opinions I have come to trust. Well, lots of things there. First of all, thanks for that letter. You know, we instead of stockpiling our enormous national wealth in some way, um, we passed that uh, several trillion dollar tax relief for the wealthiest, most privileged of Americans, including the, the wealthiest corporations of America, um, which meant that that does not leave a lot of um, slack, a lot of excess wealth 
lying around when we really need it at a time like this. So we may rue the day that that so-called tax reform bill was passed in the last couple of years. But but here's the thing: if you came to me tomorrow and 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 said I can't feed I can't feed my family, you know I would try to share with you. Um, if I were the government, let's say I gave you a thousand dollars, you're not going to go buy a telescope or a new camera or uh, a, a widescreen television with that thousand dollars. You're going to buy food and shoes for your son, and you're going to pay your rent, and you're going to put gasoline in your car. Um, in other words, you're going to use that money to stay alive at some very modest level. And then that money is not going to stay in your pocket. It's not going into savings. You're not investing it in the stock market. That money goes straight to the grocer, to the dry cleaners, to the gas station, uh, to uh, whoever you're renting your your apartment from. And then they use that money to um, pay off their mortgages and to do the things they need to do to keep their business open. And so when you give people money at a time like this, it's not as if they're going to hoard it or misuse it to buy bonbons. You know, some of that will always occur, but it's a very, very, very tiny percentage. And so it's in our interest as a nation to put money into the hands of people because they will spend it right back up the chain. There is no evidence of any sort that people won't just put this right back into circulation. And so it seems like a no-brainer to me. Um, it's what Andrew Yang was talking about. We're going to need a guaranteed baseline national income, probably anyway, when the robotics and AI industries devastate what's left of our workforce. But we also desperately need it right now. And anyone who says, well, why should we give these people this money? They're not understanding. People don't cling to it. They use it to stay alive. And the money then goes to the, the corner drugstore or the corner grocery or to the, the hardware store where you get the new faucet because your your sink is dripping. And so it, it seems to me that, that we moralize these situations unnecessarily, and we need to think of them as, as ways of keeping the economy churning forward in some modest sense. But it is a fundamental change and foreign to most Americans who didn't really think in these terms that the government was powerful and rich enough to do this for us. At this point, sir, we need to take a short break. I'm anxious to return to the conversation. I'd like to remind listeners that if you'd like to contact the Jefferson Hour, go to jeffersonhour.com. You can support the show. You can send in your questions and comments. Right now, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back, everyone, to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Um, this is a special out-of-character edition. We've asked our friends around the country to report in about how they're coping, uh, what they're reading, uh, what their concerns are, uh, how they see this pandemic uh, working its way out in the next months or years in American life. And we've been getting a tremendous uh, set of responses, and I hope they'll keep coming. Uh, everyone's got a story. I just was summarizing um, Defoe's book, A Journal of the Plague Year, and one of the of the twenty takeaways I had is that everyone's going to have a story to tell. You know, if you if you were alive when John Kennedy was assassinated, everyone uh, who was alive then has a story to tell about that. And if you were alive on September eleventh, two thousand one, everyone has a story of how they responded, how they coped, uh, what, what their concerns were, how they reconnected with their family, how they reached out to people that they hadn't been talking with for. Uh, a number of months or years and so on, who they, whom they lost if they did, and how it changed our lives at airports and in every other way. And and this is going to be the mother load of stories. Everyone is going to have tremendous, uh, important, sometimes tragic, um, often sad and bewildered stories to tell about the pandemic of, of 2020 or maybe 2020, 2021. And so we're eager for our listeners to uh, to let us know what they're thinking and how they're coping and to ask us questions uh, if there's any way we can be useful in answering them. I've been recommending lots of books in the last couple of weeks, and they are really helping me. I, I'm just thinking of, at the moment of uh, Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year, which is a classic uh, written in 1721. But I'm also reading John M. Barry's book, The Great Influenza, about the Spanish flu pandemic of, of 1918, which killed 655,000 Americans and 57 to 100 million people worldwide. The, the pandemic literature, David, is rich 
and fascinating and helpful. I'm, I'm teaching these online courses. I've got a new one going now on the Enlightenment. And these courses help us to put our, our, our concerns at the moment into the context of history and literature. And I, I speak only for myself, but they are enormously helpful in realizing that this is not the first time this has happened, and it's not the last, but we have some tremendous advantages over every previous pandemic in human history because we know germ theory, we know what a virus is, we know what a vaccine does, and we know how to formulate that vaccine. And it's inevitable that within the next two years, and probably half of that, maybe a th maybe one-fourth of that, there will be an effective vaccine that, in, which will allow us to get on top of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I heartily recommend the literature of pandemics, and I'll send you a list of books that we can post on the Jefferson Hour site. Great. Uh, let's let's see if we can get through some of these uh, emails. Uh, th there's a lot here. I'll start with Mindy Tambellini from Seattle. She writes, it has been interesting watching people's reactions as things went from theoretical to very real very quickly. Schools are closed for at least six weeks. We're homeschooling. Bars and restaurants are closed. Buses are empty. I feel safe for the most part as I truly believe our governor is trying to get ahead of the epidemic and I see neighbors helping each other and resources being poured back into the community as people are unable to work and families lose income. It is very odd and very day by day adjusting to a very odd reality. Bradley Edward thanks us for the show and says he's trying to live a more Jeffersonian life. He also says... I've read Dumas Malone's six volumes before, but in the midst of this pandemic, I'm undertaking a challenge. Read all six volumes from 2 p.m. today until 2 p.m. on 11-4. How about that? Uh, 2 p.m. When's the terminus date? November 4th? Yep. All right. So that gives people six months. That's a that's one volume a month. It is a, a magnificent biography. It's definitive. You know, it, it, I don't agree entirely with the interpretation of Jefferson provided in Malone's six volumes, but in terms of its facts, its accuracy it's it's a comprehensive look at Jefferson in all of the phases of his life using the primary documents, which are chiefly his letters. It's something that can never be repeated. You know, there may be better uh, multi-volume biographies of Jefferson over time, but there will never be another biography of Jefferson that accomplishes as much as uh, Dumas Malone did in his six volumes. So that's a great thing to do. I'm trying to read War and Peace. I've made runs at it a number of times in my life. And if I don't finish it this time, that means I didn't want to finish it. <laughs> we heard from Nathan Hepner, who we've heard from before. He teaches at Northern Arizona. He says that classes are online, but compared to the things that our forebears had to deal with, I don't think too much is being demanded of us. Um, Priscilla Albright writes, and she says she is uh, gardening to take her mind off the present and reading Nathaniel Philbrick's Mayflower. That's good, always good great. Sue Hush, she lives uh, in Ridgeway, Colorado. I bet you know where that is. That's out in the western part of Colorado. Beautiful country. Hello out there. Yeah, south of Montrose and Grand Junction, where you perform, she says. They're a town of 950 close-knit community. The streets are vacant, and we are very worried about our local businesses and those who work in the service economy being able to survive this. You know, David, when we, if you think about the social compact, that's, that's what I love about the Thomas Jefferson Hours, because it takes us back to the the essential thing. So, you know, what is a, we all think, oh, government this and government that, and my governor or this president or that senator or what's Congress doing? And those are sort of yeah, interesting diversions. But if you step back and say, well, what what is government? So we have this problem that more than 90% of the American people have been sheltering in place. And that means that most businesses, from restaurants to um, nail parlors, to uh, hardware stores, to, you know, you name it, um, to boutiques, to clothing shops, uh, to dry cleaners, um, most shops in the country have been closed. And to the extent that they are open or opening, it's curbside service. And if you're going to take a restaurant and say that only one out of every four tables can be occupied, there's no restaurant owner in America who will say that that cash flows. And so everybody is suffering. I mean, there are a few people that aren't, and there are a few corporations that aren't. I heard, for example, that uh, Papa John's Pizza had its best quarter ever. Uh, 
just uh, in the in the past three months. So you know we get it that some things are going to do a little bit better than others, but for the most part, everybody is suffering and suffer and, and the anxiety is greater than the suffering. It's one thing to realize I can't pay my workers for May. It's another thing to think my life savings went into this shop and by September, I may have to close the doors forever. And so then you say, okay, well, if that's the situation, how does a great nation, you know, the, the wealthiest nation in, in human history, how does that nation cope with this? And there are many ways to do it, but we don't have savings. We know that there are, that the people's savings accounts in, in the U.S. are very low. We may have to learn a lesson about that from this. Um, our forebears did during the Great Depression. But what we really need is the nation as a unit, as a social compact to do what it takes. And so we've got to keep those businesses open. And particularly, we have to make sure that everybody who um, has rent to pay and, and wants to put food on the table for their children has the wherewithal to do that. And if we don't do that, they're going to take their rifle or their pistol and go get the food that they need. It's that simple. There are no, no people ever sits around and starves to death for not having enough food. And so we're going to see unbelievable dislocation if we don't find a social mechanism, and that really in this case means the national government of the United States, to guarantee some kind of basic national social stability. And when it's over, we can figure out what to do. Do we pay it back? Do we um, increase taxes by 10% for everyone for, for 15 or 20 years? We'll have to figure out because there will be inflation and there will be lots of problems if, if we just start printing money recklessly. But if we don't, if you want to see what that social breakdown looks like, read Lord of the Flies. Here's another one uh, from Mike Schment, uh, another Colorado listener from Colorado Springs. He says, today I heard you talk about Stephen King's The Stand and Daniel Defoe's A Journal of the Plague Year. There is another in that genre called Earth Abides by George R. Stewart. It was published in 1949, and it is, it's another take on the few survivors of a killing disease. There are no supernatural factors, and the characters are just normal people. Do you know this book? I don't, but I'm going to get it. Earth Abides by George Stewart. I read it. You have? On his recommendation, I read it, yeah. How is it? It's not, uh, how do we say, the author does not naturally incline towards people becoming Jeffersonian and, um, and, and learning what they could. Scott Blake, he was a couple weeks behind on the show. He says, last night, he listened to the one about the 1793 pandemic. He is living about 15 miles south of San Francisco. Last week, he went out near the beach and was appalled to see a huge number of people congregating. Yesterday, the parking lots at the beach section were closed to discourage such gatherings. Shame that it takes that step for people to get a clue. Now, he wrote to us on March 26th. I'm not sure what the situation is out there now. His main trouble right now is he's job searching. And that's a tough thing to do, he says, when you're 64 and with all of these things happening. He ends by saying, I console myself with the realization that almost everyone is affected negatively by this crisis. I'm also doing all I can reasonably do to be a compliant and caring citizen. Good for you, sir. That's excellent. Well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, best wishes to all of the people who have been writing to us, and we take all of the, your letters very seriously, and that you can sense there's a, a seriousness of purpose about them that um, that is um, uh, deeper than it might be under other circumstances. A couple of other books that I'm reading, and, I, and believe me, recommend books. So, uh, Dunn's Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions is a, is a magnificent book. Um, I'm reading Emily St. John Mandel's Station Eleven, which is about a plague in North America that, well, actually it's a global plague, and afterwards this sort of um, caravan company uh, produces Shakespeare in the Toronto area um, for uh, whatever refugees are left after all of this. And I read Lawrence Wright's new novel, which was rushed into print, the great Lawrence Wright who wrote The Looming Towers. Wait, wait, I, what is that? It's a novel about a global pandemic that's, and it, it, it's interesting, it, 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 they think it's the Russians, uh, but it's not the Russians. It turns out it's global warming, uh, not to be a spoiler alert, but the um, at the end, uh, they realize that the, the the Siberian ice has melted and exposed some mammoths and mastodons. Oh, I have I have to read this because that's that's kind of like a coffee table thing. I'm 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 saying is yeah, you know the tundra is melting. There's 
There's viruses in there that are, haven't been in the for tens of thousands. That's What's what happens. The people, title? people think that it's terror. It's called The End of October by Lawrence Wright. He's a terrific writer. I have to writer. get that. And it, it, you know, it, it, this is kind of the surprise ending. No, you're not spoiled in the book, are you? Yeah, I did spoil the book, but it's worth <laughs> it. It's, it's a really interesting read. So there's so much to read on this. And just to the point of our friend from from the San Francisco area, you know, it's, to sort of paraphrase John Dunn, he said, every man's death diminishes me. Every jerk's behavior diminishes all of us because if you go out to the beach um, and you don't wear a mask and you're congregating with 30 of your your friends playing volleyball and drinking, somebody there is going to be a carrier and then they're going to go back. They're going to fan out to San Francisco and San Jose and a whole other um, number of, of communities in that part of the world and they're going to spread that disease. So it's not about you, buddy. Everything we know about this says that it gets transferred by careless people who don't know they're carrying it, and it explodes exponentially. We got a letter from Lucy Werner, and she writes, in response to your request, I had a European tour booked for August of 2020, the highlight of which was to be attending a performance of the Passion Play in Oberammergau, Germany. The town has been producing this play since the early 1600s as a result of a vow made with God to be spared from the bubonic plague. With the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the play has been postponed until 2022. <laughs> well, the Passion Play, I have a couple of things to say. First of all, Lucy's a friend of ours, and we wish her well. I've never seen that Passion Play in Germany, but I saw the one in Spearfish, South Dakota. In fact, I am happy to say that I was there for the last ever performance of the Passion Play uh, in Spearfish, South Dakota, with, um, and it was a big community-wide thing. It went on for 50 years, and I went with the great David Borlaug, a uh, friend of this program and an old dear friend of mine. And uh, Good guy. There yeah. was something wonderful about being there in the last performance, and I don't want to sound blasphemous, but when Jesus was nailed to the cross, which is in a very high place in the Black Hills there, a, a freak thunderstorm came in. And it turned out to be the fastest crucifixion in human history because the actor got <laughs> got off that cross within seconds and wound up in the but, tomb. But they've been doing this play since the 1600s. Now it's it's canceled because of COVID nineteen. Well, temp temporarily. We we just have a, a few seconds left this week, but I, I do want to mention one last letter. And there's very many more. I hope we'll have a chance to get to them in the future. But from Blanton McLean, uh, Williamsburg. And he writes, greetings from Williamsburg and to Mr. Swenson, by whom you, Clay, are less guided than Jefferson by Madison, and and most especially to Catherine as well, whose attributed snarkiness was learned entirely from you. This is kind of a her, set of cheap shots. First he says like, that well, I don't listen yeah, well, to you the way Jefferson <laughs> listened to Madison. Then he says no, that he, my daughter's snarkiness saying, is inherited. I think he's saying I'm not worthy. and I, We don't have time to go into all of his letter, but he was surprised that you didn't recommend Thucydides' account of the 430 BC plague in Athens. Yes, that I did, as a matter of fact, elsewhere. So I've been writing a series of articles for Governing Magazine. Magazine, and people can find them at governing.com. And in one of the first, I talked about plagues in Oedipus Rex in Homer's Iliad. And then the longest section of that article was about the great Athenian plague, which led to one of the most extraordinary chapters in Thucydides' book, The History of the Peloponnesian War. So go to governing.com and you will find uh, uh, the history and literature of, of plagues and, and pandemics. But that certainly is an important one. He ends his letter saying that he has plans to go to the statue of Jefferson on the William and Mary campus uh, early in the morning on his birthday to burn an incense stick. Well, Jefferson would probably think that incense is not the best tribute to him. It'd be better if you if you went there and planted a flower or went there and recited the Declaration of Independence. But still, any tribute to the third uh, president of the United States is valuable. I love the statue at William and Mary. Well, sir, we are out of time for this week. Uh, I have to say, I so enjoy these conversations with you, even though we can't be together in the barn. It's uh, it's really therapeutic for me, and I suspect from the many emails we read this week, it's 
the same for others. Go to jeffersonhour.com. You can learn more about Clay's online courses and find out a lot more about the show. And with that, sir, I shall bid you farewell this week. So stay safe, everyone, and practice social distancing and listen to the health experts. You know, Jefferson quoted Francis Bacon, knowledge is power. Politicians are going to look at this in one way, um, some better and some worse. But scientists are the people we need to be listening to because they actually know what they're talking about and they don't have to um, chasten or distort their points of view uh, for the politics of what is possible. They get to say what is ideal and then we, the rest of us, will determine how to arrange the politics of um, enforcing the strictures of scientists. But, but to, to be skeptical of science at a time like this is really just a species of madness and even death. We'll see you next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.